Afternoon, folks. Welcome to this special edition of the Daily Politics, live from Edinburgh, where, as you can see, the weather is glorious, and from London, where I'm told it's Guy Driech. So, will the kingdom stay united, or does Scotland go its own way? The polls and the bookies favour the union. The nationalists say, don't underestimate this man, Alex Salmond, Scotland's first minister. He has a habit of confounding the pollsters and the bookies. Scottish voters have been bombarded with stats and spin. Many say they're bamboozled. Some have even managed to avoid the whole thing altogether, as our Adam's been finding out. You don't know what it is? No. The independence referendum? No, I've never heard any of it. Westminster, a committee of MPs, says the taxpayer lost a billion pounds in the sale of Royal Mail. Was the 500-year-old business sold off too cheap? And is the government's flagship universal credit programme on the critical list? Labour say so, the government insists not. We'll discuss. So all that in the next hour. And with us for the duration today, Leslie Riddock from The Scotsman and Alec Massey from The Spectator. Welcome you both. Now, Leslie, ten weeks to go. Sum up the state of the campaign as you see it. Well, there's, there's two campaigns. There's the official one that's full of the party leaders, Alex Salmond, keynote speeches, podiums, that kind of thing. There's a grassroots one as well that's happening all over the country. I've personally been at 107 meetings since September the 9th. I've been counting. 107. Yeah, that's a lot. And I, I think kind of change happens in different ways. It can happen a little all over the place and underneath the radar. Uh, is and there a difference I between the two campaigns? Now. Obviously a difference in people, but a difference in tone, in what's being said. Yes. Um, yes. I mean, the Yes campaign is a generally optimistic, buoyant one. It has to be because it's looking to a different future. The, the No campaign is a kind of might is right campaign, and by gum do we get that. All right. Uh, Alex, how would you sum up? the state of the campaign with 10 weeks to go? Well, with 10 weeks to go, the state of the campaign is that the yes side are losing. Uh, on that, everyone agrees. There is a difference between uh, the pollsters as to exactly by how far, how much the yes campaign are losing. But at the moment, it's quite clear that no are winning. And that for that to change, I would say that, uh, you know, it's a bit like if you're playing roulette and so on, and you have 10 spins of the wheel, and if you, if you have the yes side betting on red the whole time, I think they need red to come up seven, maybe eight times out of 10 if they're to prevail. Now, they say that the polls are wrong, they're skewed, they're not capturing the mood on the ground and so on, which is far better for the yes campaign. Uh, now, of course, that could be true, but this is a simple yes-no dynamic. It's not, a, it's not a, a question where you've got a hundred different uh, shifting things that the pollsters right. have to try and find. Are you worried that the yes campaign's lost momentum? It seemed to be doing very well up until the spring, and then the gap began to widen again. Okay. I know people would say this when they're, they are perceived to be on the losing end of opinion polls, but actually, you know, they do fluctuate a lot. And the key things are, for example, things like the missing million. You talked about it in your programme last night. There's folk who've never voted in Scotland in the large housing estates. They've been canvassed by some of the young folk from radical independence, for example, and they're finding incredible, ter you know, support for independence. Oh. If they'll turn out, it, that's uh, a big course, question. which is interesting, and yeah. we don't know. And we don't know. Briefly from you, uh, Alex. Are you worried that the no campaign hasn't really yet devised a compelling and agreed case for the union? I think that is a concern. I mean, it runs heavy on the risks and uncertainties of independence. Those risks and uncertainties are, of course, unavoidable, but they're not necessarily in themselves a case against independence or, or a case for the union. And it's true that it, uh, the no campaign has relied rather more on, on sort of dreary prose than, uh, than any element of poetry. <laughs> Which is the opposite. You're meant to be campaigning in poetry and then governing prose, so you've turned it around the other way. Very well. Anyway, the, uh, the referendum is on September the 18th. The campaign has been going on forever. But we'll soon be moving into the final stretch, so let's have a look at how the polls are shaping up. Only those in the Scottish Electoral Register can vote. Uh, they'll be asked a simple question. Should Scotland be an independent country? 
Taking together each of the last polls conducted by the six major polling companies in Scotland and leaving aside the don't knows, 43% of people intend to vote yes to independence, with 57% intending to vote no. 48% of men said that they would vote yes, compared to only 38% of women. Older people need more persuasion on the merits of independence. 64% of those aged 60 or over say they intended to vote no. 36% said they would vote yes. This will be the first national election in the UK where 16 and 17 year olds are eligible to vote. So what do young people think? Well, that's not good news for the yes campaign either. Taking out those still undecided, 36% say they would vote yes, 64% say they would vote no. That's bigger than the national average. And what of English people living in Scotland? There are nearly 400,000 people who were born in England but are now living in Scotland. That's about 8% of the population, with only around a quarter of them intending to vote yes for independence. We're joined now by Professor John Curtis from the University of Strathclyde. He knows exactly what Scotland thinks, at least that's the name of his blog, so I guess you're not <laughs> going to suffer from the trade descriptions. Like your latest poll of polls has yes on 43, no on 57, mm -hmm. rough, in other words, roughly 60-40. I mean, that would suggest the campaign hasn't changed very much. Well, it hasn't changed a great deal, but it has changed enough to uh, generate continuing excitement and interest. If we go back to the position before last Christmas, indeed before the Scottish Government published its white paper on independence at the back end of November, then the polls were pointing on average to something like 61% for no and 39% for yes. It's very clear, all the opinion polls agree, it's virtually the only thing on which all the opinion polls agree, that during the winter, the yes side made progress, such that by the end of the March, we were all then looking at the yes side at around 43%. The worry for the yes side, I think, however, is that it's much less clear that they have made much progress since the back end of March. In other words, the second quarter of 2014 has not been anything like as good so far as progress is concerned as the first quarter, and therefore now with only just much more than two months to go, they still seem have a long way to go. The second reason why we have uncertainty and why this campaign will be fought very strongly to the end is the reason that's already been mentioned, which is the polls do not all agree with each other. Mm. That 43% is an average of some polls that say it's 45 to 47 and we have a poll out this morning saying yet again it's 47 and other polls saying no it's around 40 41 42 and we do not know which of those two sets of results is the, is the more accurate one if only men had the vote scotland would be independent well, certainly, if only men had the vote, there would be a very, very tight race. Some of the polls, this morning's poll again, for example, suggests that a majority of men are in favour, and that certainly there is an enormous gender gap, and that uh, this is a gap which has long, long been obvious in Scottish politics, so far as both willingness to vote for the SNP and support for independence is concerned, and it looks as though that gap has just simply remained constant throughout the course of this campaign. Is there polling or focus group data that tell us why women are more resistant? There is analysis, and I think there are basically two reasons that seem to emerge. One is that women are more, more likely to feel that the consequences of independence are uncertain, and in general, voters who think that uh, the consequences of independence are uncertain are less likely to vote yes, whether they're men or women. The second reason, it seems to be that women are less convinced that independence will bring economic benefit to Scotland. And of all the issues that this campaign is about, mm. the one that clearly matters most to voters is whether or not they think independence will be economically beneficial or not. And it just so happens that women seem to be rather more sceptical about the claims of the yes side. And again, certainly, if okay. the yes side are going to win, that is the issue on which, above all, they need to make progress. Leslie, why is the independence campaign struggling to get women's votes? Well, or that women are more able to say when they don't know than men. You know, I mean, through, through no, but history... there's a bigger number of them saying it's, no. It's not just yes. that they're more likely to say don't know, but they're I also more that. likely relative to say no rather than yes. If I could get the word in between the two of you. The point is just that demonstration. When you say something, you can very easily get, get folk jumping down your throats. It's very much easier to kind of keep your powder dry, hide behind whatever vote is going to, you know, response is going to keep some, you know, distance and allow you to have time to think things through. And I think it's no coincidence that Christmas allowed a bit of a, a, of a fillet for the Yes campaign because it allowed intimate, ordinary conversations between people that were sincere and were less sloganized. Now, when you get this very contested public space, I'd suggest that practically everyone runs screaming from it, apart from those employed to remain. But they're not running screaming from it, they're saying no. 
That's fine. I think people, the, the view on the yes well, side is that you can move people a little bit along the way over time. Now, I'll quite grant you, time's running out. Okay. But the opinion polls wouldn't even have put us here because they didn't predict the last two SNP election victories. Well, so I'll, I'm I'll more going by what's on the ground. Has it come as a shock to Mr. Salmond that uh, young folk are not anywhere as enthusiastic about indep as independent as he thought? Well, it might come as a disappointment, but I think in truth it was always a mistake to assume that the SNP and franchise 16 and 17 year olds simply on the grounds that they thought it might be to their advantage. I think here we have to accept that the SNP believe in principle that 16 and 17 year olds have the vote. They have done it on the odd election over which it they have control It wasn't part of his franchise. calculation that young people were likely to be more national. Well, I wasn't denying that possibility, uh, but I was suggesting to you, Andrew, that probably was not the principal motivation. Here, I think one, there's one example where probably a government did something because it believed in it, rather than necessarily because it simply thought it was to its advantage. Are you surprised? that young people are, are distinctly less in favour of independence than their parents? Uh, not especially, because young people, after all, have grown up in an era uh, where you have the a Scottish Parliament in Edinburgh, where, if you like, um, some of the political aspirations of the Scottish people have been met, uh, whereas people in their uh, late 30s and their 40s and early 50s and so on were the generation that were campaigning for that Parliament and for whom, therefore, this, if you like, the institutional apparatus of Scottish politics was perhaps more important uh, than it is for newly enfranchised 16, 17 and 18 year olds. And of course it's also the case that we don't really know exactly how many 16, 17 and 18 year olds are all no. that engaged with politics no, anyway. That, that's it. And we don't know how many will vote and they tend not to vote in huge numbers. Yes. But I must say I'm surprised that the 16 and 17 year olds are not more uh, nationalist minded. There's still a large chunk of don't knows in all the polls, decent amount. The nationalists are kind of betting maybe betting the farm on the don't know skewing their way, but I noticed some recent polls suggested they were actually falling the way that, uh, of people that had read, already made up their minds. Yeah, we've had a couple of opinion polls this morning and also one last weekend, both of which suggest that maybe finally the number of don't knows, which in truth, Andrew, are not particularly large. They never have they been particularly large, but they, they do look as though they're beginning to come down. And the truth is that so far, the evidence is that if indeed they're coming down, it's not making any difference at all to the relative strength of yes and no. And to that extent, at least, if the yes side were hoping to, to gain from the decisions of the undecided, there isn't any evidence of that happening right. so far. I've got one final question for you, and Leslie alluded to it. Because you hear it said again and again, particularly by those in favour of independence and by the SNP, mm -hmm. their supporters in the media, that in 2011, 10 weeks before the Holyrood elections to mm -hmm. the parliament here, mm -hmm. Labour had a double-digit lead over the SNP, mm -hmm. But Mr. Salmon went on to win by 18 points. Mm -hmm. Is that relevant to where we are now? Not entirely relevant because it's very clear that the reason why that happened in 2011 is that, frankly, the Labour Party messed up its election campaign. And it was very much a judgment on the failure of the Labour Party rather than, uh, together with the fact that people think the SNP have been rather good at, at um, governing Scotland. But if you also look at what happened to the, opinion, to the opinion polls during that campaign, you discover that they did indeed identify a swing to the SNP, but at the same time, no swing in, uh, in terms of more people being in favour of independence. The SNP won because they were regarded as capable of providing Scotland with government, not because this was a vote in favour of independence. John Curtis, thank you very much. Good as always to talk to you. Let's go back to Joko in London. Thanks, Joko. Now, Labour used to rule the roost here in Scotland. Not anymore. In 2011, the Nationalists did what the voting system was specifically designed to avoid. They won a majority of seats in the Scottish Parliament. Scottish Labour is now the largest opposition party. I'm joined by the leader, Joanne Lamont. Welcome to The Daily Politics. Now, Alistair Darling said this week that the repercussions of a yes vote would be worse than the 2008 banking crisis for Scotland. So there we have it. Just more of the same old scaremongering. Well, I don't think it's scaremongering. And I think it is important in this debate that we put out there what the consequences are. But how would I you know? accept. I accept that the people, regardless of what the consequence would be, would still want Scotland to be a separate country. I appreciate that, understand the passion in that. But on the other side, it is important for people who don't know, who aren't sure, understand the scale of the challenge we would be facing. Independent experts saying that they would either have to be cuts or rising taxes to stand still at the moment. Right, but that, that, that may or may not be true, but it's not a 2008 scale banking crisis. 
Why would anybody know that that would be a consequence? Well, that is Alistair Darling's judgment. Well, he was, a, he was a great deal closer to the banking crisis than I was. So I would, I, would, I would respect what he says in that Come regard. Come up with something but positive. The, but the, well, I'll, I'll tell you a positive thing. I, th I love the fact that I live in a country where I can be Scottish, can be proud of my identity, my many identities, which is both as a Glaswegian and a, an islander, and be part of another country where we can work together, we cooperate, we find ways of sorting out our differences, that in tough times we can share res resource, pool resource, pool risk. I love that. And I tell you, there are many people in this country who feel the same. And they say to me, please tell people that we feel as passionately about being in the United Kingdom as the yes people feel passionately about Scotland leaving the United Kingdom. Well, except only 23% of Scots now regard themselves as British. But that's not, I mean, what the label you put on yourself is not the same as how people well, feel about the, the country tells you how you that feel. they're living in. Well, and I can you call yourself a Glaswegian because you feel a Glaswegian. Well, I call myself a Glaswegian because that's where I was born. Yeah, I call myself an islander because that's where my heart is. But the, the point about this is that regardless of what the individual labels people put on themselves, I know that very many people look at the United Kingdom and think we've achieved something pretty special. Uh, it's finding a way of protecting our, our Scottish okay. institutions, but also being able to share that, across the whole of United As John Kirst has explained uh, uh, to us, uh, Labour was well ahead in the polls against Mr Salmon. You spectacularly collapsed, and Mr Salmon won an overall majority. Uh, you're leading that party now. What's to stop another spectacular collapse? Well, that explains why we are far from complacent. That's why we are out every day. And as, as I heard uh, Lesley saying earlier, in the numbers of meetings we're doing, doing community events, going and speaking to people, because we know, we know that in our hearts, we, we don't have the confidence because of what happened in 2011, just as here the polls are OK. The polls tell us something important, but it will never be a substitute, in my view, for us making sure that we're talking to people, the, persuading, the, the, arguing and listening to what they're the saying. The polls tell us that although you're the leader of the biggest party against uh, independence, only 40% of Scots know who you are. Well, that's a work in progress. That's a work in we progress for time. me. No, but they don't have to know. They're not all going to get to know well, you in the next 10 weeks. Well, with respect, I'm I, sure I, with respect I will have, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. It, um, I have a critical role, but actually the debate is beyond party. And one of the things sure. that's also come out of this but debate then, is that when politicians argue with each other, and I've been as guilty as anybody else, people stop listening. And what okay. we need to uh, make sure in the next period is that the voices that are heard are the people who understand the consequences for them, their families. How long have you been Labour leader? Two and a half years. And only 40% of Scots know you. 64% of people in Scotland think Ed Miliband is doing badly as Labour leader. That's 64% of Scots think Mr Miller was doing badly. Why should they listen to him about independence? Well, I tell you, I was out with Ed Miliband on two occasions and two weekends in Scotland um, at the time of the, of the, the frigate being, the, the carrier being launched and for Armed Services Day. And what struck me then was how popular he was, the extent to which people want to come and speak to him, the way people in which... People always want to come well, and speak to well, famous respect, uh, well, with respect. 64% well, of would, people in Scotland said... In the question, how is he doing as Labour leader badly? Actually, only 58% of people in London thought he was doing it. The Scots think even but worse you, of him, and yet you, he's the, the you, leader. Well, I'll tell you, if you ask people, what do they think of his idea of taking on the big energy companies who've been ripping them off in Scotland, like everywhere else, people support him in that. They are behind him on some of the very big issues. When you talk about zero hours contracts, when you talk about the way in which oh. people's work is exploited, he All is right. on the side of people and it, I, see, I see it myself in working with him. That it, he, he has that passion to, to make sure that actually politics is about a different kind of way of doing business. All right, All right. okay, I mean, enough of it. It's just not coming through in the polls. You may be right, but the polls don't uh, tell us that. If Scotland votes no on September the 18th, can you tell us now, can you commit now to what extra devolution Scotland would get? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you what our commitment is. You'll know we have a devolution commission proposal. What's the single most important thing in it for you? There are two things in it, I think. Okay. And on one, one side of the argument, which is really important, is the importance of, which I have come to view on over a, a period, which is that if you have a parliament which simply spends money and has no accountability for raising any of it, you end up not taking on the really difficult debates. I think people are having well, to face how right across. It. Right, about how we have to face that across so the it was country. Wrong the way you designed I it. think I think at the, in the in the early stages we did actually put in tax raising powers. Oh. The SNP allowed them to 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 fall into dis, dis, well, disuse. Well, you didn't use it either. No, it wasn't that we didn't. That 
Let's make my separate point, which is that the SNP actually, we're now in a place okay. where you couldn't even use them. So you think but it should the Parliament should have tax rates? I, I think it should have tax rates powers. I think it's about accountability. But on the other side, I think the argument about powers should not be about institutions arguing with each other. It's about how these powers are used. And that is why, within our devolution commission proposals, we also talk about what you would take to meet the needs of cities so they can be strong economies for the country, but also what and can you do in the uh, island communities as well. Yeah. But you say you want more tax raising powers. Is it not true that Ed Bowles vetoed your devolution plans and going too far on tax raising powers? No. You had no say That's on that? That's not true. You know, he didn't veto anything. I work in partnership with my colleagues at, at the UK level. What we did through the devolution commission, we could test it. I suppose the easy thing might have been simply to say, uh, we'll just put in what looks and sounds attractive. Didn't but we did test this. What, what I wanted, what we said in our interim report, mm. that we were minded to look at that. We then tested it. And what I wanted was, on the one hand, fiscal mm. accountability, but on the other hand, you don't break, you don't break that sharing and resources. You don't create unnecessary tax. What was Ed Bowles' view on, on your original idea of full devolution of income unnecessary tax? Unnecessary tax competition. What I'm saying to you is we came to a conclusion through the Devolution Commission, which was represented from across the party, that we struck the right balance between making sure there was accountability, right. but also that we sure. didn't put ourselves in a place I where we were actually losing the benefits of sharing resources across the United right. Kingdom. But what was Ed Balls's view on giving full devolution of income tax, which had been in your interim report? I don't know what his direct view in that was. What I'm saying is through the you devolution don't speak to commission. The shadow chancellor of course, on that we do. You can't do any devolution of power without the shadow chancellor, if he becomes chancellor, mm. agreeing. Of course we do. Of course we do. In so fact, I was out say? campaigning with him. I was out campaigning with him. What I'm saying to you is that through the period between the interim report and the full report, the conclusion we came to across and as a united movement was that was the right way to strike the balance. Your party told us that with Scottish devolution, independence would be killed stone dead. Mm -hmm. That didn't quite go according to plan. Why would more devolution kill independence? That's not the purpose. That is not the purpose. I, I, I was very clear when the devolution commission proposals came out. I said, I'll tell you this. The first thing that the SNP will say is it's not good enough because that's not what they want. They want to, to break every political link no, with the rest of the United Kingdom. I understand Kingdom. that. So it wasn't, but, 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 so, uh, it's, a more, it's a more fundamental question. We were told by the Labour yeah. Party that if Scotland had its own parliament with a limited array of powers of domestic matters, that would kill independent stone dead. That was in 1999. Mm -hmm. This is now 2014 and we're having a referendum mm -hmm. on independence. No, well, I, you were wrong. I didn't say in 1999 that would kill independence no, stone be dead party. because you'll never kill something stone dead simply by setting up an institution. You have to win the political argument. And the point I'm making about powers is actually the argument is not between institutions, it's how you use power, I'm how you sorry. get people involved. And that is the debate that we have to have, rather than one which simply says okay. which institution is the stronger one. And Let how me. do we actually make sure that wherever power is exercised, it relates to the real people's right. lives Let and their experience. From our journalist here, Alec Massey. Uh, well, I mean, what you see is the intellectual incoherence and bankruptcy of the Scottish Labour Party and so on, a party that hasn't had a meaningful idea in at least a dozen years. Um, you know, Labour haven't really recovered from the shock of losing in 2007, let alone in 2011. Um, you know, it's a party that had this sort of arrogance and complacency to think it swanked around the place speaking f as, as the voice of the people. It turns out that the people actually uh, don't think that the Labour Party represents them. Um, of course, the SNP is guilty of some of the same mistakes. Right. Um, but, you know, Labour's devolution proposals are utterly incoherent. On the one hand, you know, they say that, well, we need to, to do something with income tax and so on, but we need to put in a mechanism that says you can only increase income tax and uh, you can't cut income That's tax. Um, so it's partisan as well as being idiotic. Quick thought from you, Leslie. Uh, the political culture of Scotland is different, actually, from south of the border. And actually, Scots have been voting for your party for the best part of 80 years. And that's distinctly different. And I think a lot of it's folks south of the border can actually recognise that. It's not distinctly different so the question, from Liverpool and Manchester. Question, it's not distinctly if different. I could, if I could finish, because Andrew asked me a question. It's not distinctly different between Scotland and England. <laughs> that's <laughs> not the difference. What, what's that's the not question? Well, what, what I'm trying to say is there's the a reason we're sitting here today. And it's not just yeah, opinion not polls. It's what's not. Question? It's not all of the rest of that. The question is, don't you recognise that the Scots want a social democracy and the rest of Britain doesn't? I don't, I don't see the world in that, in that way. The I've voting, honestly, the voting, on I've the voting honestly, alone. I think what has happened, when people rejected Tory politics in, across the United Kingdom, in some parts of, of England, in, in, uh, historically, 
people in the north or whatever voted Labour and in Scotland they voted Labour too. The SNP afforded people an opportunity to vote for another party to say they were against the Tory party. I simply do not accept... I don't Go accept... Just, just right, I don't no, accept no, no. your construction. I can't accept your construction that says right, the people in Newcastle, you've, you've, Glasgow, Cardiff don't right. think the same things and believe in the why, same things and whatever the same why things. Why is Gordon Brown not involved in the Better Together campaign? He is involved in the Better No, no, he does his own thing. He's involved in campaigning against independence, but he's not involved in no, the Better Together No, that's not true. Campaign. He was actually out, he was actually out doing does an he event. Does he speak at Better Together yes, events? Yes, he was at one last week because we were discussing it uh, is yesterday. That the one? No, I, he, Alan, I'm only saying that because I remember that's the one it was at. He is a powerhouse of a ideas powerhouse. Yeah, of, of, in terms of this campaign, right. as Alistair Darling has been too. And actually, more importantly, of course they are, and okay. more importantly, ordinary people right across the country, beyond parties, are saying they want to have their voice heard in this debate too. John Lamont, thank you very much. Okay. Back to Joe in London. Thanks, Joko. Now, the turnout is predicted to be very high, perhaps over 80%. But have most already made up their minds? Will the don't knows break differently from those who already know how they're going to vote? What do voters feel about the campaign? We sent our Adam out with his, quotes, scientific mood box. I've come to the seaside town of Largs on the west coast of Scotland. And don't worry, I've remembered the mood box. Today, we're going to ask people if they feel informed or not about the referendum. Although I'm not sure it's going to work on here. Informed or not? Well, yes, I am informed. Informed enough? Informed enough, I should think, I. That's me. She's informed. <laughs> She's ready to vote I'm now. Informed, I'm <laughs> I think he needs to give us some more answers, Alex Salmon, but I think we know a lot about it. Go ahead, then. I'm informed. Thank you very much. Thank you. And where have you got most of your information from? Some through the post. Uh, I had a phone call as well. And... Oh, they phoned you up? Yeah. Who phoned you up? The SNP. Do you hey. feel informed, sir? Um, not totally, because I still don't think they're telling the whole truth about the financial side of everything that's going on. Right. I don't really know. I just don't think I'm getting... You don't even know what you don't know no. yet? <laughs> I don't oh, know that must be I very confusing. <laughs> you don't know what it is? No. The independence referendum? No, I I've never heard any of it. Have you been living in a cave? <laughs> I actually haven't, honestly. Yeah. Certain things until we do it, if, it, if that happens. We're not going to know until we actually... Make the step. What does the UK Treasury say the union is worth per person in Scotland? So the UK Treasury yeah. says uh, £1,400. He is well informed. That is what they say. Oh, but what, do, what does the Yes campaign say in return? I think they were trying to bump it up a bit. There is a Yes Scotland shop over there. I wonder if we'll see any campaigners coming to vote. Come and grab one of my balls. <laughs> Have a sniff of these. What do you think? Have you been doing the referendum at yeah, school? Yeah. Like, what have you learnt about it? Uh, it's complicated. It's complicated. <laughs> that is a very good it's... summary, yes. <laughs> What's the most unbelievable thing you've heard? They carry on with a pound. Right, you just don't believe any of that. Well, it says we're going to have it, and then all the English guys are turning around and saying, no, well, no, so what's it going to be? Well, it's just started raining, but I know the perfect place to take cover, a famous Largs landmark. Let's go. You feel informed and, and simultaneously not informed enough. Exactly. You felt informed One and not. Each. One in each. Oh, I'm informed, yes. Oh, right, so you're a bit of an expert, are you? Oh, definitely. People are getting so overloaded, they're getting fed up with it now. I think everyone right. has their own opinion, so I just kind of, I'm waiting. And then... Some might say that's a little bit lazy. Uh, well, it's lazy, it's also... It, Oh, yeah, it's lazy. Right. Stop raining now. Right, here comes the ferry from the Isle of Cumbrae. So there should be loads of people about to get off. Grab a ball. Do you feel informed about the referendum? So what, what do you think? You've got enough information, sir? No. No? no that's what would you like to know? Everything. Everything? What What's the crucial piece of information you'd like to know? How it's going to affect me. Okay. and my grandchildren and the next one's coming up. Well, about 50% of people say they don't feel very well informed about the referendum. Oh, no, I've left it behind. Bye.
All right, I'm parading his balls around larks. The place will never be the same again. With us now, Blair Jenkins, who leads the Yes campaign. Welcome back on The Daily Politics. Why, according to the polls, are young Scots rejecting your independence message? Well, that's not what the polls show, Andrew. I think normally we do pretty well in the 16, 24 uh, demographic. You're losing two to one. Not, to, not in some of the polls. They're, they're, Most they're of the different, polls different show this. you losing two to one. They're different on this as they are on other things. We've scored, uh, we've actually shown in some polls, a majority with 16, 24 year olds. I think the point you're... You've lost every plebiscite in every school in the country. No, that's not true. That's completely untrue. I've taken part in some personally, so I can absolutely personally well, guarantee you that we've won. You've lost balloted debates. The yeah. average of the poll of polls mm. is that young Scots are two to one against independence. Why? I think what I've found in, in the debates we've taken part in is that young Scots, I think, are very open to this debate. Um, we've seen that uh, people are capable of changing their minds, that they move around perhaps, perhaps more than an older part of the population do. Oh. Um, I'm very confident by the time we get to September that young Scots will vote yes. And why are women rejecting the arguments for independence? I think, uh, Leslie touched on this point earlier, I think um, it's true that uh, I think women are going to make their minds up later than men. I mean, that's, uh, uh, I think, uh, maybe a slightly sweeping statement, but I think it's true. I think it's a very sweeping you just, statement. You discussed, you discussed earlier, uh, well, you know, it's funny, I was on a public um, panel with, uh, with someone from a leading polling organisation organization just the other week who said that he thought up to almost 50% of the population were, as he put it, not my phrase, and I wouldn't use this phrase, were up for grabs, not necessarily don't knows, but still potentially people who might change their minds. Okay. So, um, I mean, there is certainly all to play for. Just, you talked, about, no, sorry, you, you talked uh, about the parallel with the SNP earlier, and you know, you're right, you wouldn't push the parallel too much between the 2011 Scottish election and the referendum we're about to have, although it is the case that the gender gap for people who are going to vote SNP closed by polling day. And it's clearly worrying the Labour Party on that. I can, I can see that. But maybe one of the reasons is uncertainty or risk, because you say that an independent Scotland should keep the pound, still have a monetary union with the UK, continue seamless membership of the EU, same seamless membership of NATO. Now, these are all things Scotland has at the moment as part of the UK. Mm. And although that's what you want, you can't guarantee a single one of these things. Well, I think you're right on a couple of those at least. It's not possible to be absolutely certain, but I think the reason is uh, fairly evident, and I think people in Scotland are switching on to this. The reason for some of the uncertainty in relation to things like, for instance, the precise method by which we continue an EU membership is because the UK government is the only entity which could get that position clarified at an EU level and won't do it. So we're up against a campaign which, you know, and you may say this is perfectly legitimate, we're up against a campaign whose main strategy is uncertainty and to maintain as much uncertainty as possible. Um, and you, their only hope is fear. As you, you sit know. here today in this beautiful Edinburgh, Edinburgh yep. backdrop, uh, there's not one of these things you can guarantee mm. an independent Scotland would have. But what, what we can guarantee is that an independent Scotland will get the government it elects. Well, uh, I, we won't get, yeah, I understand I that. That's axiomatic. Yeah. Yeah. But there you are, can't guarantee any of these there things. There are some... Well, again, I think in some of these issues, and I, I, I would accept entirely that, uh, for instance, the, the currency union is one, people are going to have to make up their minds on who they trust. And we're in the fortunate position that we know from every single poll that's done that people in Scotland trust the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish okay. Government much, much more than right. they trust the Westminster well, Parliament or the Westminster Government. Let's take uh, Scotland's membership of the EU. Hmm. Uh, it's the Scottish Government's intention, if it wins, that it would do these negotiations. It used to tell us uh, we just stay as a member. Now it says we'd have to renegotiate while the negotiations with London from within. Were, were, were going, from within, were going yeah. up. Well, except and when Mr Barroso said that actually EU membership could not be taken for granted, he's the Commission President, indeed it could be very difficult, you, not you personally, the Scottish Nationals, dismissed him as, ah, he'll be gone by mm. the time this comes up. Mr Juncker, the new President of the Commission, has now said he agrees 100% with Mr Barroso. So are you just going to dismiss Mr Juncker now? Well, I think what Mr Juncker has been trying to do this week in various meetings and conversations he's been having is to say as little as possible, frankly, about the, the Scottish referendum. What he said is it's a decision for the people of Scotland that he and the EU will respect the outcome of that process. Yeah. Uh, you know what else I, he said, don't you? I, he said many things and uh, he's been quoted he in said when ways he by would, different he people. He when he was asked whether he agreed um, or not with the views of Mr Van Rompuy, mm. Uh, who's the pres president of the European mm. Council, and of Mr. Barroza, president of the Commission, now to be taken over by Mr. Juncker, he said his answer was... Per Mr. Mm. Van Rompuy and Mr. Barroza were perfectly clear. I don't have to change a word as far as they're 
uh, declarations were concerned. When Mr Barroso um, sat down earlier this year, having expressed his opinion on, uh, on Scotland's uh, continuing membership, the rushing noise we heard was the rushing sound of almost every expert on European affairs distancing themselves from his remarks. So only the top so, man's wrong? Well, I think the reality about this, and we've known this for some time, is that this will not be a legalistic decision taken by civil servants in the Commission. This is a political decision which will be reached in the interest of the, the future of the EU. I think anyone... So and again, are this, you dismissing this, what this, Mr Juncker says? I think, I think he was very diplomatic this week in terms of trying well, to, to say stay... He's in, in, terms of trying to, in terms of trying to stay out oh. of the debate. I think it is just incredible, and this is where trust and credibility come in, it is just incredible to think that if the people of Scotland exercise their right of self-determination, and as I believe they will, vote in September to become an independent country, that this will somehow lead to hostility, exclusion, no, no, expulsion. No, no, that's not. The, the, the issue is how long it may take you and what you may have to renego mm. renegotiate yeah. and the different terms mm. that you may get in Europe on VAT, on children's clothes, mm. on getting a share of the British rebate. That's the argument. But I want to move on mm. to one. All the Scottish government's calculations here depend on oil revenues making up for the loss of public spending money mm. that currently comes via the London Treasury. But also, every calculation the Scottish Government's made has overestimated the oil revenues. So why should we trust you? Well, lots of people have their different um, future projections for oil no, revenues. I, I, and no, I'm not talking well, about future projections, yeah. uh, uh, Blair Jenkins. I'm talking about projections the ah. Scottish Government made in 2010-11 up till now. Yeah. And the reality of the revenues yeah. we got is a lot less than the government's projections. And there were particular reasons, as you know, for volatility. There's and, always and, reasons of projections. Well, that's right. That's right. But um, I think that... So the, why should we trust you? Because, well, the, the, the future of oil, and while one cannot be certain about um, price, one could be absolutely certain about the volume of oil that remains in the North Sea. One could be very certain about the fact that uh, the companies who operate there are making record levels of investment. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, so there is every reason to believe that North Sea oil, which is not the basis for the argument uh, economically for Scottish independence, mm -hmm. will provide uh, a very, very um, attractive no. source of revenue for Scottish governments for oh, many, many years to come. But it is vital because at the moment, uh, Scottish pub per capita public spending is about £1,200 mm. higher than the UK average. The Scottish national government is, is to say, but we'll get the oil revenues which currently mm. go to London. Yeah. That will be a wash. We'll be able to afford it. But if your projections of oil revenues, and by the way, you were out by almost £4 billion, that's the well, cost not of... Personally, the, not me that, personally. Well, not you personally. That's the cost of the whole Scottish school ah. system. If you're out by that much, you can't guarantee that word again, that these were, revenues will pay for you, your public spending. And you know that years you're talking about, there were particular circumstances where uh, the companies were able to take advantage of the investment that they had made to reduce their tax liability. So that, that resulted in the, the loss of but, revenue, but the reduction of revenue. But you knew that when you made the projections. Well, well, again, I didn't make the projections. But if you look forward, um, there are lots of uh, highly credible people, including the industry themselves, who have much more uh, uh, bullish or optimistic projections for oil revenue than the UK government has. Okay. Uh, I mean, the OBR has come out with another oil forecast uh, today on, on the current uh, lines. I mean, they'll probably be denying the existence of North Sea oil by the time we get to September Even 18. the OBR has been consistently optimistic. But we have to leave it there, Blair Jenkins. Thank you. Now, if you have uh, a vote on Scottish independence, you're still undecided, despite the best efforts of any of our guests today, then don't panic. Our Giles has been following the campaign. You know, for some, because, let's face it, not everybody is fussed, the dream of Scottish independence and the concept of Britain as a union are both a cause celeb. In some cases, literally. The tartan glitterati, you see, have not been shy of raising their proverbial kilts and showing us what they really think on the big question. The movie stars, for example, Brian Cox, that's the gritty Hannibal actor, not the boyish physicist, has made his pitch to us, no less. You uh, are in favour of Scottish independence. If I you am. Had, have you got a vote in September? No, I haven't. Because you don't live in Scotland. I don't live in Scotland. And as for coming together, Alan isn't so sure. Because, you know, after uh, independence, and, I, and I, I do support it and I hope that it happens, after that, we will still be British. We will still be a part of the British Isles. However, Mike Myers is so ogre the idea of independence. Shrek wants what the will of the Scottish people want. And, uh, listen, I love Scotland. <laughs> I hope they remain part of Britain, and if they don't, I still love them. OK, that's interesting and conclusive, coming from a man who's Canadian and just does a Scottish accent. Captain Jack Harkness from Doctor Who and Torchwood. 
Ah, now there's a Barrow man to believe in. Let's stand together and let us not, like snarling curs, in wrangling be divided. Hmm. Apparently, that little bit of poem meant that he's for unionism, with jazz hands. The writers are at it too. Harry Potter author J.K. Rowling conjured up a big million donation to the Better Together campaign, and with it bought herself a bout of unpleasant online abuse. Independence right now is, is not a great idea. Why? We're in the middle of a huge, terrible, terrifying worldwide recession. Um, I just think now is a time for stability. That's a magic that isn't working on Irvin Welsh, who's been spotted boarding a train leaving the British Union station. That sense of Britishness, I don't think it's, I don't think it's, it's served by a kind of political union anymore, though. Frankie Boyle agrees, funnily enough, or unfunnily, depending on your taste. I, I, I kind of romanticise about Scotland being this foreign country. And our culture is actually really vibrant and, and something that we should try and project, get away from these people. Uh, Thinking of culture, there's even musicians in each camp. The Proclaimers. Remember them? The first pop stars with thick specks and huge mouths when they sang have long championed the SNP. We are voting yes for an independent Scotland because we believe we should take responsibility for our own lives. We are voting yes for an independent Scotland because uh, we want to see a fairer and more just society. But David Bowie is a no. You'll recognise him at these music awards coming up. He's the one who isn't there and is being represented by Kate Moss. Thank you very, very much. And Scotland, stay with us. So the big issue is not so much will they, won't they, but who will they ask next? Kermit the Frog? Well, yes, he told a magazine he absolutely supported David Bowie's viewpoint, especially if Miss Piggy could become the Queen of Scotland. I don't know. Muppet. We've only got a few seconds. Are these celebrities making any difference on either side? Well, it's astonishing with the welter of folk that we've had, actually, that there's even, you know, 40% of, of, of Scots still <laughs> considering voting yes. But when David Bowie came out with that, we had the greatest fun. There was... Everybody was looking at the titles. We had The Man Who Fell to Perth. I saw all that. All those kind of... Like, that so was actually, a good side it, of it Twitter. Gives, yeah, it does. It <laughs> gives a great opportunity oh. for fun. Uh, let us hope not. That's all you've got to say. Let us hope not. Why not? Um, because why, uh, the idea that someone's vote should, on something of this importance should be determined or influenced by what some uh, two-bit actor, pop star or other sort of reality TV contestant has to say strikes me as being beyond depressing and dispiriting. Agreed. <laughs> He's very harsh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's it for today. Thanks to our guests, especially Leslie and Alex. Uh, we'll be back in this spot in September. We'll just be days away from that crucial uh, vote on September the 18th here in Scotland. In the meantime, I'll be back on Sunday with the Sunday Politics on BBC One. I'll be speaking to Scotland's uh, Deputy First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon. I hope you can join me then, 11am Sunday. Bye-bye today from beautiful Edinburgh. <laughs>